Now let's uh, talk about some coding. Here's the, here's my, oh, you can't see it, sorry. Here's the code. Here's some sample code. Now it's a very, very simple C program. Notice it's got a header comment at the top. Notice, I, I, I haven't mentioned this before now, that you might have noticed it in some code that I've just put up and not explained. There's another way of doing comments. I showed you one way of doing comments, didn't I? The way where you put just two slashes and that comments out that line. Everything from the two slashes to the end of the line is, is just a comment. So I could say, this is a comment. Yep, everything from the slashes to the end of the line is a comment. But it's, the comment stops at the end of the line. But if you start a comment like this, slash asterisk, then everything after there is a comment until you get to an asterisk slash. So that lets you co comment out quickly whole chunks of code which I quite like when I'm testing. If I've got a program that's got an error, I don't know where the error is, I just get the comments and I chunk out half the program and see if the error is still there. And if it is, then I chunk out half of the remainder and see if the error is still there. And if it's not, I unchunk that and chunk out the second half and see if that, and I just keep zooming in until I get it to one or two lines causing the error very, very quickly. And then I can undo it all really fast by just unchunking, <laughs> by removing the comments. Of course, another way is just saving a copy of the original file and physically deleting the stuff, but I quite, if I'm acting quickly, often I'll just do it with comments. Okay, so that's our comment. We're including stat.io. We're including studlib.h. <clears throat> Does anyone remember why we're including studlib, by the way? What are we using out of studlib? Exit success. This here is returning exit success, which is literally, uh, by the preprocessor, pre that's going to be converted into a number. It's going to change the actual source code before it's compiled. It's going to convert exit success into a number because there's a hash define, hash defining exit success to be some number in studlib.h. Now, I wonder what number it hash defines it to. What do you think? Zero. Could be zero. How do you know it's zero? How could we tell? Oh, we could print it out. Let's do that. Okay, we could just say, that's a good idea. Who said that? Well done. We could print if exit success is percent %d. Oh, no, this is just the message I'm printing out. Remember, percent %d now gets replaced with the number new line, and the value I want to print out. So does everyone understand how printf works? It prints out this string, the format string, except whenever there's a percent something in the format string, it doesn't print the percent something out, it replaces it with a number or, or whatever I want it to replace it with. And after the comma here, I tell it what I want it to stick in where the percent d is. And I'll say, I'd like you to print out, stick in exit, success. Let's run that. Oh, and there's my console. Exit success is zero. All right, you were right. Well done, guys. And that was a good idea. Um, now, let's just do some fooling around with variables a little bit. Do you remember we had int? If you say int x, then what I'm doing, what, is a, what happens when the program uh, reaches that line? Or what is that line till a... Oh, yeah, sorry, question. Uh, um, uh, if it's just going to be exit success every time, it's hash defining it. Yes. Oh, why don't I write zero? Um, because maybe exit success isn't zero on every system. Now, someone's going to say, oh, I'm sure it's always defined to be, but you can use C to write programs on crazy chips on washing machines. It doesn't have to be on computers. So maybe they have different notions of what exit success would be. I don't think exit success would ever change. I'm pretty sure it's enough of a convention that everyone always expects it to be zero, that it always will be. But someone might have a crazy idea one day of making it different. And if I say exit success, the words convey the meaning if I just have the number, that, that tells me the value, and I sort of want another meaning, even though, in this case, the number is probably synonymous with the value. Um, but just in general, whenever we have a number in our program, which only has limited meaning, yet yeah, the meaning of a number is, if I said six foot two, what does that number mean to you? You're guessing it's my height because there's a bit of context. Yeah, 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 yeah. What if I said 1.84? You probably might guess it's a height again based on the previous question, but if you just saw the number 1.84, the number has no meaning, it's just a number. When we're communicating with other people, the meaning of the number is, comes from the context in which it's used and the words we use around it, like, oh, I bet you're about 1.84 uh, meters high, or something like that. So the number doesn't convey much meaning. So in a program, we try 
as much as possible not to use numbers, but words that mean the meaning. So this is saying the program is a success. Woohoo! And later on we'll see programs that aren't a success. There'll be an if statement, and if this happens, the program's a success. If that happens, bip bong, return exit failure. Yeah. Oh, if I write a zero in the task, it'll still be correct, so you won't lose any mark for correctness. But style-wise, it's not perfect style. Yeah, style, we don't really want to see magic numbers. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's a really good question. Okay, so index is setting some memory aside for X. And we saw yesterday, um, uh, I told you, I think that ints are, are numbers, possibly signed, possibly unsigned. Oh, I think we decided they would be signed, most likely, didn't we? It would store positive and negative values. They're whole numbers, they don't store decimals. And on most computers, uh, the int is the amount of memory that's the most convenient for the computer to use. And on most computers that you guys have sitting in front of you, that amount of memory, uh, int is probably defined to be, how big do you think? We sort of guessed it yesterday. Four bytes. Though modern computers like this one here, probably that's probably an eight byte computer. Is that a 64 bit computer? Yeah, yeah. But I bet an int on it is still at the moment defined to be four bytes. But later versions of GCC are probably bumping up when everyone else is doing it to eight bytes. So we're guessing that's setting about four bytes of memory aside to store a number. All right, let's just do some storing. X equals um, one, two, three, four. Printf x is percent %d. That means the value I'm about to give, it to, give you prints it, print it out as a whole number. So print it out essentially as an int. Okay, so hopefully there's no surprises here. What's going to happen? It's, go it's going to set aside some memory for x. It's going to set aside four bytes. It's going to load the number one, two, three, four into those four bytes. Oh, that's a coincidence. It doesn't put one into one byte, two into another byte, three into another. Um, each byte can store, how much can each byte store? Remember, each byte is eight bits, so it can store 255. That's right, 256 different values in a byte. So if, if it's storing one, two, three, four, I wonder how it's going to do it. How can it store such a big number in four bytes? How would you store it? You've got to store... I don't know, this is memory address 1,000, this is memory address 1,001, this is memory address 1,002, this is memory address 1,003, and somewhere inside it, the compiler remembers that whenever anyone talks about X, they really mean whatever's stored at address 1,000. The compiler remembers that in a table. All right, so it's going to store the number 1, 2, 3, 4. How are you going to store the number 1, 2, 3, 4, 1,234 in four bytes? What's, a one, what's one thing you could do? Yeah, you could break it up into digits, and that would let you store a four-digit number. But obviously, um, that's only going to get you to 9,999, and we can go much bigger because we have essentially 255 different digits that could go in each box, not just nine. Break it up into like three-digit <coughs> numbers in each box. Yeah, you could. That's absolutely right. You could do it. You could say, um, uh, a th a th well, you couldn't break it into three-digit numbers because you can only represent um, numbers up to 200 or something, but you could break it into two-digit numbers. You could store... Um, uh, uh, one, uh, well, I don't know, we're we going to store zeros here, maybe, and we could store it like that. You can see we're still not using all the value because we're only using 99 possible digits that can go in each box, and each box capable of storing 256 digits. Um, another way of doing it is just working out how many 256s are in it. How many 256s are in 1, 2, 3, 4? There's four of them. Uh, what is four times that? 1024. So, how much is left over? 210. 210 is left over. So, how the com most computers would probably store it is they'd say there's four lots of 255, 56, I keep saying that, and there's 210 left over, 210 lots of one. And the most computers essentially would be storing in base 256. And this would tell you how many 256 squares there were. This would tell you how many 256. That's one way of storing it, isn't it? That's all. That's a pretty compact way. So uh, let's just run it, check it works. Boom. Yes, prints out X is 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, so let's keep putting numbers in. Let's see. What about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? Can we store that inside an int? Yeah, it seems happy. What about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6? Yep. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Yep. Oh, sorry, I'm not scrolling down. Sorry. Thank you for <laughs> being sceptical. <laughs> this isn't actually a live output, it's just a, a screenshot I saved earlier. 
I'm saying correct. Clear the log. Now, um, let's go eight. Yep. Let's go nine. Yep. Let's go ten. Yep. Let's go eleven. Oh, error. Warning. Overflow in implicit constant conversion. So it's... The warning I'm getting here is that this essentially is that this number is too big to fit into an int. That number, even written in base 255, 256, is more than four digits long. Now, we, got, we could keep fooling around like this, trying out the different types, seeing how much we can fit in a short, how much we can fit in a char, how much we can fit in a float. But one problem is going to be that as I keep doing things, it's going to get very, very messy. All the different examples I'm doing are going to run together if I just keep it in one file. And if I just override each example with a new example, then you're going to lose, when I give you this file at the end, the ex all the stuff we've done. So I really need some way of taking these chunks out and running them separately. Yes? How would you go about printing a float? How would you print a float? Oh, oh yeah, let's have a go. I like the way you're thinking. But except, I don't want to do it here because it's going to mark up this example. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut out all this stuff here, and I'm going to put it in a function, which I've got down below here, called example one. Example one uh, prints out, I'm doing example one, and then it prints out what exit success is. It's void and void. Gee, what does that mean? What I've done now is I've defined a function. Do you remember what a function is? Function is something that takes stuff in and puts something out. This example doesn't need to take anything in. When, a C, when, a C, when you write a program in C that doesn't take anything in, a function that doesn't take anything, uh, then you say void in, in the brackets to tell C that you mean it not to take anything. You could leave that out, but unfortunately, because of the way C works, that, that will still work, but C will make a couple of assumptions and won't properly check some things. So if we say void, we're telling it, actually, I mean to have nothing in here and it will actually check that there is nothing passed in. So that's the safest thing to do. Um, now, a function that takes nothing in, well, that's always going to do the same thing, isn't it? This behavior changes as the different inputs change, but if it doesn't take anything in, then it can only ever do one thing. Can you guys think of a function that, that doesn't take anything in, that always does the same thing? Hello world? Hello world? Oh, yeah. The hello world program. Yeah, hello world program, you run it, prints hello world. It doesn't matter what you tell it, when you run it, all it prints is hello world. So that's a, yeah, absolutely, that's a constant function. So a function that doesn't take anything in. And if this function's also a bit weird. In fact, by our definition of function, it's not really a function because it's not returning any values. It's not giving anything back to the outside world. It's not computing some number that it's giving to us. It's just doing something. It's printing something on the screen, then it's stopping. It doesn't actually pass any values back to the program. If a function has, it returns nothing, you say void, and that means returning nothing. You can't do this, though you might be tempted to. You can't just put nothing. Because C, bless its heart, if you put nothing, thinks, oh, you must mean int. Because int rhymes with nothing. So it will automatically assume that there's an int in there if you put nothing. So let's say void to make it clear it's nothing. All right, so let's run our program now. Uh, example one. Oh, how am I going to call example one? How am I going to make my main function use example one? What do I have to say? I have to say just the name of the function. That's what calls it. Yeah, example Example one. So the main program is going to print something out. It's going to run example one. It's going to print something out. Then it's going to return to its success. All right, let's run the program and see what happens. Oh, implicit declaration of function example one. What does that mean? You've seen that. There's that main error message we get at the moment. Yeah, it doesn't know what example one is. It's toddling down here, executing the program, or in this case, it's toddling down, compiling it, actually. Line by line, starting at the top, working its way down. It gets to example one, and it goes, hey, hang on. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Here, you want to run something called example one. I've never heard of that before. We, we could say, compiler, it's just down below, right in front of you. The compiler's going, no, no, see nothing. Because the compiler never goes back. It just starts at the top and goes down. Doesn't look ahead. Never doesn't do two passes through the program. So at any given point, it's only allowed to use what it's already seen. And at this point, it hasn't seen that function. So it can't use it. Now we define we define the function here. We say what the function does. That's called defining it here. I guess we could do this. I'm going to cut it. 
and paste it at the top. Now let's see what happens. Oh, it's as happy as it can be. And prints out exit success is zero. Because by the time it gets to example one, it already knows what example one is because we defined it at the top and it, so it passed through that definition on the way to get down there. So that in a sense solves the problem, but it's a pretty icky solution. Why don't we like that solution? Can you, anyone think of a problem with it? Yeah, main's at the bottom. It's the most important thing. If you're trying to understand the program, you want to start with main. The little details, why, why do you have to wade through all the little details to get to the, you know, it's called main for a reason. <laughs> it's the main thing. So um, absolutely, it's confusing to us if we have to put all the details at the top and the important stuff at the bottom. We really want to read through the program top to bottom ourselves and it making sense as we go. And we're quite relaxed about postponing things. So if I see, if I'm reading through the function and I see there's something here called run test one, I don't, I'm not like the compiler, I'm not going to freak out because I don't know what run test one is. I'm going to think, oh, okay, that name tells me something about it already. I've got a rough idea what it does. If I really wanted to know what it did in detail, I could search through the file and find where it is. But at the moment, I'm just trying to understand the big picture, so I'm just going to look at main. We like looking at the big picture. We like going top down. The computer, the compiler is bottom up. It needs to know all the details before it can put them together. So, yeah, we don't really want to do that. I'd like to, I, I think a more natural place for it is below. So we've defined it below... But the program wants to know it exists above, so we can give it something called a declaration. And a declaration is just saying, I declare this function exists. So here we go. We just copy the guts of the function, the type definition we call that, of the function. We stick it at the top. We don't put the curly braces and we stop it with a semicolon. And that's saying, there is a function called example one. It takes in no inputs and it puts out no outputs. It's not giving it the definition of the function, but it's declaring that it exists. And now the compiler is going to be completely happy when it sees example one. It doesn't know what example one does, but it knows the type signature of example one, so that's happy and it'll keep going. Let's just check that that works. Yep, all right, it's completely happy. All right, so that's example one working, but now let's look at our example two. Oh, someone asked something about a float. Should we do that? We'll write a new function, void example float. And what was your question about floats? How do you print a float out? Okay, so I'll show you and we'll just check it works. Printf, you could Google printf, by the way, and it will give you a list of all the printf codes. Man printf will work on the Unix system here, or you can even Google man printf and it'll give you the man page. In, in, it's crazy, but in Unix, help is pronounced man. Why is that? No, it's because it came out of Berkeley. And they're just really laid back. So if you ask them for help, you'd go, man, what's that mean? No, it's thought for manual. That's right. <laughs> Berkeley's an awesome place. Thurston has just come back from Berkeley. I was a bit anxious while he was there because Berkeley, as you know, well, all of San Fran, all, well, all of California is like the San Andreas Fault runs right through the middle. And I always say to my wife, why do people live there? They're on a fault line. They're due for a huge earthquake soon. Why are they living there? It just it makes me tense. And I thought... Thurston's there, I just hope this isn't the beginning of a couple of earthquakes, though I guess earthquakes aren't linked in that way. But uh, yeah, it's crazy. Thurston's going over there, we haven't mentioned this before, I don't think, but he got into Berkeley to do his PhD. Isn't that awesome? You see Berkeley. So everyone, he's just come, wait, let's wave at Thurston. Can we just give him a big hand? Where is he? Well done, Thurston. <laughs> he's off to, off to Berkeley to do um, his PhD and he will amaze the world. And here we go. He got me this. How about that? It's a Berkeley thing. It's no thing. So I just put it there. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, okay. Uh, let's stop talking about Berkeley and Orange County and all those other places on the San Andreas fault line because it's freaking me out. Let's talk about floats. How do we print out a float? We could say, actually, do you mind if we don't use a float if we use a double instead? Because I don't really like floats. I think they're too small. Your program will just have rounding errors if you use floats. I don't think you should ever use them. Height equals 1.84. Printf, your height is percent %f. Print out the height. Where does it go? Oh, it didn't print it out. Why not? We didn't call the function. So we better call it. What's it called? Example double. Example double. Oh, it doesn't understand it. Implicit definition. We're using it now before it's been defined, so thank you. I have to define it up here, declare it up here. Sorry, not define it. And 
it printed out, your height is 1.840000. Did you not want that many decimal places? Here's an exercise for you. Go on the uh, interweb and work out how to format this to print out a different number of decimal places. They're called the format strings. So just look up the format strings for printf, and you'll see how to print out uh, floating point numbers, double numbers, characters, hexadecimal numbers. Oh, I can show you hexadecimal numbers because they're fun. Uh, what if we wanted to go example hex, and let's just go long height equals one, two, three, four. Your height is, and you want to print it in hex, you go percent x. Let's have a look at that. Oh, have I not? Warning, format x percent sign, unsigned int. But argument has type long int. Oh, x, oh, okay, I have to go lx. There we are. Uh, I want it to be x. I want it to display it in hex rather than in decimal. Hex is hexadecimal. So if we look down the bottom here, it'll say, uh, where is it? Oh, I didn't tell it to do it. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It was a long, not an int. So I, if it was just an int, you just say x. That's right. You got it. Say that again? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I've done the wrong thing here. There we go. Let's call the example hex. Brackets, brackets. Where are the brackets? Oh. <laughs> it's very good to keep track of all the bugs you see, all the warnings you see and ways you fix them. Because after a while, as soon as a message pops up, you sort of know roughly where to look and what to do. In the early days, it's a bit of guesswork. Here we are. Your height is 4D2. 4D2. So 1, 2, 3, 4 is 4D2 in hex. 4, and I think you'll find 210 is, in hexadecimal, I think you'll find it's D2. Does that make sense? Yeah. So a hexadecimal base 16, um, two hexadecimal digits, 16 times 16 is 256, two hexadecimal digits make up... Um, 256 make up a byte. So every byte is represented by two hexadecimal digits. So the two digits for this byte is D2, and the two digits for this byte are 04, and it's obviously not displaying leading zeros. So it's just displaying the four. Questions about anything? Yes? Uh, just one thing. When you're, call, when you're actually putting a variable into a function, yes? call it in main, what, how do you go about defining it? Because I found when I was Defining something in main and then using it in a function. Ah, okay. Let's see how to do that. What if we wanted to pass the height in? I didn't want this function to have no input. It's a pretty hopeless function if it doesn't have any input. I really want it to be given the height and printed out. So I really want it to take in a double called height and then just print it out. Double height. Let's make a height. Height equals 2.351. And then I'll pass in height here. Now all the other functions are confusing me so I'm just going to get rid of them. And this is a convenient thing about breaking things into functions. In that one line now, deleting that one line, I'm deleting reference to that whole elaborate chunk. It's really nice. Like, and if I wanted to do the functions in a different order, I could have just reordered them up the top here and they'll get executed in a different order rather than if I had it all just flat, everything in one function, I'd have had to drag all the lines and move all the lines around. But because I've broken them into sub-functions, I can just change the order in which the functions are called and that affects um, does that make sense? It makes it easier to move. If you can chunk something up and put it in a lump and then just refer to that lump by name, then moving the lumps around, instead of moving the lumps around, you just move the names around, the order in which you call them, affects the order in which things are done. So example double now gets passed in a height. The other functions aren't being called, but that's okay. They're st they can still be there uh, and not, with no effect. That's right, the program won't mind. And it's going to call it, pass in a height, and the height's going to be 2.31 in this case. Pass it into the function, and then the function's going to print that out. Let's check that that works. Oh, no, it didn't. Conflicting types, for example, double. What does that mean? Conflicting types. You said something else at the top. I said something at the top. What did I say at the top? I, I declared it. I said, don't worry, compiler, relax. This function is going to have no inputs and no outputs. And then I'm calling it and giving it an input, and it's quite reasonably saying, that's not what you promised me up the top. <laughs> so let's just put in the... Okay, so did it work? Let's have a look. Your height is 2.31. So it worked. Now, we got the, the value from the outside program into the function by passing it in through the brackets. 
Notice that the variable on the outside is called height, and the variable on the inside of the function is called height. Do they have to be called the same thing? No. In fact, they're two completely different variables with the same name. It's just like in your family you might have a brother called one, and in your family you might have a brother called one. They're not the same person, even though they've got the same name. And when in your family we're talking about your brother, you'll say, oh, one went to the shops the other day. It's just taken for granted if you're talking, you're talking about members in your family. And if you said one is sick in bed today, it's just sort of taken for granted you're talking about the one that's in your family. The area, when I'm talking about a variable, the area in which it's defined is called its scope. And the scope of every variable defined in a function is that function. So I declared down here height. Where is it? I declared here height. Uh, I declared it inside this function between these two curly braces. So that variable only lives as long as this function lives. As long as we're inside here executing these lines, that exists. And when we reach the end of the function, that variable's thrown away and that memory is reused. So I didn't have to call it height. Let's make it really clear they didn't have to be the same name. Uh, let's call it meters. Oh, that's not right. I'm in the wrong function. Uh, let's call it meters. Richard, yes. you say that uh, void in the beginning, that means that there's no output, right? There's no, yeah, the function doesn't give a value back. So main calls the function, but it's not passing any value back to main. It is, however, printing on the screen. Okay. It's like this. Um, it do, yeah, it does say that again. There's no return, is, that's what it's meaning. It's like if you have a toaster and you put the toast in the toaster and your toast is your function, the, the bread's the inputs, the toast that pops out at the end is the output. You put it in the toaster, you turn the toaster on, what does the toaster do while it's cooking? It smells, it smokes, it gets hot. But in terms of me getting stuff out of the toaster, they're all irrelevant, those things. All I care about is a piece of toast that comes out the end. That's what the toaster returns to me. But it does these other things in the world too. They're called side effects. So here, these functions all have side effects. It prints something on the screen. There's no way, main can't tell that you've printed on the screen. Main can't see the screen, only the humans outside the computer can see what's on the screen. So that function has a side effect of printing on the screen, but as far as main's concerned, it's not giving it anything back. It's not returning any values. If I'd said down here return seven or something, then it would be returning something to main, and I'd have to say, oh, we're returning an int, if seven was an int in that case. Are we all right here? Yeah, okay, let's check that it works. And it worked, and it printed out there. So meters only lives from there to there, and then it disappears. And height only lives from here, where it's declared, uh, oh, where it's actually, um, so I declare it here, then I give it a value here. From where I declare it onwards, there's memory set aside for it to the end of that function. And at the end of that function, that height is thrown away. Now, functions I call from inside this function cannot access that height. It's like a secret private piece of information. It's only available to that function. If I wanted one of those other functions to have height, I have to pass it to them inside the brackets. Yeah? The declaration on the top is still called double height, and you change it into meters. Why? Ah, yeah, 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 good point. Uh, the, when I declared it up here, I said, look, it returns nothing, and it expects one input called height, but when I actually define it down the bottom here, I said it expects, it returns nothing, expects one input that's a double called meters. It turns out that this name here is just for our convenience. The computer doesn't care what name you put there. All it cares is it's expecting one argument passed in, which is a double, and it's expecting uh, nothing returned, void. And the actual name we give it in the function is irrelevant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I normally try and give it a good name. You could just say double D. Yeah, but what does that mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Give, it, give it a proper name. Give it a hint as to what it's looking for. Though, mind you, <laughs> we're laughing about pointless names for a function that has a pointless name. Du example double, what does that mean? That doesn't mean anything either, does it? So we should have given it a better one. Print out my height or something we would have called it. Okay. Okay, um, now I wanted to just give you a quick brain teaser. Oh yeah, question? Does that mean that uh, if you wanted to scan f for that function, you have to do it externally of the function? If you wanted to use scan f? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Another good question. Scan F is when the, func when the uh, computer reads something from the keyboard, right? Reads a value into the program. 
it turns out that's a side effect too. That's like the numbers aren't passed in through the parameters, the brackets of a function. It's reading them from the keyboard. It's sneakily getting extra information in addition to what main gave it. You're absolutely entitled to use scanf wherever you want to in your program. Be aware when you do that, you've got a side effect in that function. We'll later on see we don't really like side effects so much, so we try and compartmentalize where they are. But yeah, if your function needs to read in a value from the keyboard, it can read it in the function. It doesn't have to read it in the main. You could read it in the main and pass it into the function, or you could read it in the function and use it directly. And I guess the decision you'd make, for correctness point of view, they'd both be correct. The design decision you'd make in deciding, shall I read it in main and pass it in, or shall I read it in the inner function, the decision you'd be thinking, what's the, what, what, what's the scope of this variable for me? Does it really only have meaning inside this function, or do I need to use it several times? If it really only has meaning in the function, then I might as well get the function to read it, I guess. And if it's something that gets used by many functions, then probably I should read it in a higher function and then pass it into all the sub-functions rather than getting the user to retype the number in each time. Yes? Um, in the same way that you can have like a short-lived int inside a function, so yes. it's not able to use out of it, can you have a short-lived function inside a function? You can define function in functions, but don't. We're not going to do it in this course. Uh, defining functions and functions is, um, you, I mean, it's sensible to want to group functions together in various ways. So you can have libraries of functions and collections of functions that make sense that go together being passed around as chunks. But the way we're going to do that isn't by defining them inside functions. The way we're going to do that is by defining them in separate files. And all the functions with one purpose will be in one file. And all the functions with another purpose will be in another file. Yeah. Um, they were all really good questions. Uh -huh.